In this video, I'm talking about the truth about oxalates. What are oxalates? Are they a problem? And are you susceptible to high oxalates? And so we think about oxalates, they're actually a plant defense chemical. They're organic acid within plants, uh, particularly nuts, green leafy vegetables, different types of grains, ha even fruit has oxalates. They help protect the plant and they also are, in a sense, a, a defense chemical to where if a predator is consuming lots and lots of that plant, they're gonna have higher amounts of these oxalates, which can cause unwanted health problems. In fact, with humans, oxalates have been associated, high oxalates have been associated with kidney stones. Kidney stones can come from a, a number of different types of sources uh, of, of kidney stones, but calcium oxalate stones building up in the bladder, that's the number one most leading cause, right? And, and, and by a lot, it's like 80 to 90% of kidney stones caused by too much calcium oxalate building up in the bladder. So kidney stones are a common one. Also autism, there's more and more research talking about high oxalates associated with autism and then also chronic pain syndromes as well. And so here's the thing and the truth about oxalates. And I'm gonna go through a lot of details in this video. The truth about oxalates is this, is that there are some people who do not metabolize oxalates well and oxalates are triggering a lot of health problems for them. There are other people who metabolize oxalates well, and they can consume higher amounts of oxalates in their diet and not have any unwanted health problems. Everybody's a little bit unique and different, and I think about it like a bell curve. So you have a bell curve, and you have kind of, in a sense, you have the outliers on the sides. And so on one side of the outliers, you have people that really need to be on a low oxalate diet, and they need to be on it long term. You have other people on the other side that can handle, but it's a small percentage, very high amounts of oxalates, and they have very ripe species of a bacteria called Oxalobacter formingis in their gut, and that Oxalobacter formingis eats the oxalates, right? It actually eats the oxalates, and it will produce actually nutrients, postbiotic compounds from the oxalates that are beneficial for our health. And this is why there are some people that can eat a high oxalate diet, meaning they're eating tons of salads, big, plant foods, you know, lots of spinach, lots of nuts, right? They're, they're vegans or vegetarian and vegans, and they're thriving. They seem to be thriving. Their skin looks great. They have tons of energy. They're able to sleep great. Mental functions really well because their body is able to metabolize the oxalates effectively, and that their diet is, is, is personalized in a sense. It's, it's working really, really well for them, whereas other people can't. They try that same diet, and they really struggle. And then I would say the majority of people are somewhere in the middle of that bell curve where we can handle a certain threshold level of oxalates. We don't necessarily need a very low oxalate diet, but we can handle a certain threshold level. And when we go above that, now we start getting unwanted health problems. And so the key really is kind of finding out where is your threshold level for oxalates. And again, these are a plant defense chemical. Now, eating oxalates is not the only way we get elevations in oxalates. And this is key as well. If we have lost our oxalobacter formingis and we have high levels of yeast or fungal species in our gut, those fungal species will actually create oxalates. So our oxalate levels can be increased when we have higher amounts of yeast, candida, and different types of fungal species that are overgrowing. We always have some level of fungal species, some level of candida in our gut. They're a commensal microbe. However, when they are overgrowing, now we end up with more problems. And usually a high stress, high sugar, high processed food diet, and perhaps living in a moldy home, um, having, again, a lot of stress, not having good sleep habits, those are all gonna predispose us to developing a candida overgrowth or any sort of mold, mycotoxin overgrowth in our system or fungal overgrowth. And so obviously if we have a history of that, alcohol, high alcohol use, um, a high amount of antibiotics, if we've taken a lot of antibiotics, all of those things can predispose us to a candida overgrowth or yeast fungal species overgrowth in general, which can elevate the amount of oxalates in our system. So that's another big factor. Now, there's also a lot of talk about high vitamin C intake, particularly from a supplement, um, doing high doses of vitamin C and that increasing oxalates. And that has been shown to increase oxalates, but typically it's only doing that when we're consuming it with a meal. Typically, and, and for vitamin C supplementation in general, I think it's, it's a good idea for most people, but if you do have really high oxalates, 
it might be good to tailor down on that. Usually uh, anything over like a gram of vitamin C supplementation at any one time can increase oxalate levels. So if you're taking like 500 milligrams of vitamin C, probably not a big issue at all when it comes to oxalate levels. So that's not an area, I'm not overly concerned about vitamin C supplementation. I'm more concerned about, do we have a yeast or fungal overgrowth? And what is your threshold level for oxalate metabolism? That's the key. So let's talk about high oxalate foods. And a high oxalate food is characterized by anything over 26 milligrams per serving. A very high oxalate food would be over 100 milligrams per serving. High is 26 to 99. 10 to 25 is moderate oxalates. And then somewhere between like five and nine is low oxalate. And there are some things that have virtually no oxalates. For example, animal foods, grass-fed beef, pasture-raised eggs, um, organic yogurt, ideally getting these things organic, that's why I'm saying that. But in general, meat, dairy, eggs, zero, you have very, very little microscopic levels of oxalates, less than five milligrams of oxalates that we're gonna find in those. And that's because cows, for example, they have a lot of oxalobacter formingis that metabolizes the oxalates. They're eating plants, they're eating grass, typically, ideally, um, which is higher in oxalate and they're consuming that, but they've got a lot of this bacteria which breaks it down and metabolizes it and creates postbiotic nutrients that make the cow more healthy. And so that's the way it's supposed to be. Humans have oxalobacter formingis, but if we have a history of antibiotic usage, if we've had a really bad diet, a lot of stress, um, heavy alcohol use, things like that, we can deplete our oxalobacter formingis and not be able to break that down as well. And also just genetically, some people don't metabolize oxalates as well as other people. So that's something we gotta keep in mind. So the high oxalate foods, beets, spinach, chocolate, I know, what a bummer, right? Chocolate, sweet potatoes, rhubarb, Swiss chard, legumes, kale, soy, nuts, and seeds. So these types of foods, for example, if somebody's on a plant-based diet, I mean, these are all nutrient-dense foods, a lot of nutrients in them. But if they're not metabolizing the oxalates, oxalates themselves will actually bind to magnesium, bind to calcium, and we won't be able to absorb a lot of those nutrients as effectively. And then these oxalates are causing more health issues, right? They actually can drive up pain in the body. They can cause uh, mental confusion and brain fog. And also on top of that, of course, we talked about like kidney stones and issues like that. So these would be the high oxalate foods. And so when I'm working with people, I often tell them, especially if they're dealing with any of these symptoms, Let's, let's reduce, let's only do like maybe one to two servings of these a week, right? So let's reduce our, our consumption of these particular foods. Let's increase the amount of, you know, I, I'm a huge advocate in general. I find that most people do well with um, lots of healthy grass-fed animal foods, right? Things like that that I think can be really helpful. And then let's switch over to some of these lower oxalate foods. Like instead of spinach salads, let's do arugula salads. Broccoli is low oxalate, cauliflower, cabbage, those cruciferous, cruciferous family tends to be a little bit lower. Kale is kind of moderate to high. Onions and peas are low. Mushrooms, bananas, strawberries. Most of our fruit, I usually don't, I'm, I'm not overly concerned, even though raspberries, for example, are higher oxalate fruit, not overly concerned with getting it as much from fruit because fruit just has, in general, less plant defense chemicals that the body has to deal with. It's got a lot of structured water that can be really beneficial for cell communication. So there's a lot of benefits there. Not overly concerned about high oxalate fruit. So in general, fruit, uh, many of you guys are gonna be happy. Coffee is low oxalate, so that's a good one. A lot of different herbs, cilantro. If you like grains, white rice, oats actually are lower. And lemon, lemon and lime are key because lemon and lime actually are high in citric acid, particularly they have potassium citrate, magnesium citrate. Citrate will actually bind with oxalates and pull oxalates out of the body. So actually taking lemon, like with your salad or whatever you're consuming, squeezing lemon juice on there will provide the citric acid, the citrate, and citrate naturally binds to oxalates and will help remove oxalates. Also, foods that are low oxalate but high in calcium, calcium itself will actually bind to oxalates as well. So that's gonna be things like, and, and also high in calcium and magnesium at the same time. Things like organic unsweetened yogurt. I love Greek yogurt. If you don't have a dairy intolerance, unsweetened Greek yogurt, it's a great 
protein source. It's also high in calcium and magnesium. And that will, and also probiotics in there, right? And enzymes and things like that, that to help support the gut microbiome. So that's a really good one. Um, there's also things like uh, broccoli is a good one, bok choy, higher in calcium, lower in oxalates. So those are good. Organic raw milk, right? If you can get access to raw milk, that's another good source. Organic butter, grass-fed butter, ideally, uh, another good source of low oxalate and high calcium eggs, egg yolk, and also fish, particularly fish with bones or bone broth in general, it's gonna be high in calcium, low oxalate. So those would all be really good things to be adding in and utilizing in your diet. Um, and then what we wanna look at is also doing some sort of magnesium, potassium citrate supplement. So if you've done a test, maybe an organic acid test and showed high oxalates, you're having a lot of these symptoms, you start reducing the amount of oxalates. And you don't wanna necessarily wipe out all the oxalates. There's a condition called oxalate dumping, where if you come off oxalates too quickly, you can actually have an increase in symptoms. So typically, if you're eating a lot of these higher oxalate foods, we'll just start reducing our consumption and increasing low oxalate foods, right? Just kind of gradually doing that. And then we'll add in the magnesium potassium citrate which acts as almost like a binder for oxalates. It will help pull oxalates. And then also I like to add in some sort of a GI binder, okay? We have a product called GI Detox, which works good, but it could be like activated charcoal, zeolite, um, fulvic humic acids, um, uh, bamboo fiber. There's all, all these different types of things. Fiber in general will help to kind of pull some of the oxalates out of the system and uh, citrus pectin, for example, pectin, apple pectin, all can be really helpful for pulling oxalates out of the system. So that's typically our approach. Also, there's association between a B6 deficiency, a vitamin B6 deficiency, and poor oxalate metabolism. So we'll also wanna look at that. Now, the good thing is if you wanna get like an organic acids test to look at your oxalate metabolism, it can also look at your B6 levels and see if your B6 levels are, are sufficient. Or if you've had blood tests done, one sign of a B6 deficiency, there's a couple signs. One is um, low liver enzymes. So you need vitamin B6 in order to have optimal liver enzyme production. So if your AST, your ALT, and your GGT, these are your liver enzymes, if they are under 10, okay, so they should be somewhere between 10 and 25 is the optimal range. If they're under 10, may have a B6 deficiency. So that's something to look at. Also, homocysteine is another thing that you can look at. Homocysteine is a byproduct, amino acid byproduct, and it's an inflammatory agent, byproduct of methionine metabolism. And so with the homocysteine, if that's elevated up over nine, it's possible you may have a B6 deficiency, although it's, it's really associated with B12 and folate, but it's possible you may have B6 deficiency as well. So we wanna look at B6 levels, utilize magnesium, potassium citrate, and uh, a binder to help pull these things out. And that will help reduce the overall oxalate levels. Of course, you know we're reducing the amount of consumption. We're also looking to see if there is elevation in fungal overgrowth, right? If there's too many fungal species, candida species in our gut as well. So to summarize that, the truth about oxalates is this. Oxalates can absolutely be a big problem However, it's not a problem for everybody. Some people are able to handle high amounts of oxalates and their body is able to metabolize it. They have good genetics, they have enough B6, they um, are consuming foods that perhaps are higher in calcium as well, they have uh, foods like lemon that have magnesium, potassium, citrate, and most importantly, they have oxalobacter formingis, this bacteria in high quantities in their gut, eating the, the, the oxalates as they come into their digestive system so they don't cause the unwanted health problems. However, so there's people that are doing well with it. There's also people that really need to go on a lower oxalate diet and oxalates are causing a lot of health problems for them. If that's you, I would recommend the steps that I talked about here and that will help lower your oxalate load so you can really heal and thrive and function at your best. So hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. You know, in general, most people can handle a certain amount of oxalates. I don't overly worry about you know, if I'm gonna consume a little piece of chocolate or um, a spinach salad, I don't overly worry about it because my body, my, my oxalate metabolism is sufficient. It's, you know, somewhere in that middle of the bell curve. I can't handle too much. I definitely have noticed that if I eat too much chocolate or too much nuts, feel more inflamed, 
But in general, my body's able to metabolize it if I do smaller quantities of those higher oxalate foods and I feel really, really good. And so that's really the key is look at your symptoms, see how your body's responding to these things, clean up the root cause issues, and then try to see where your threshold level of oxalate consumption is and find the foods that you really thrive on. So hopefully you guys got a lot out of this video. Be sure to share it with somebody that you know and that you care about. And we'll see you in a future online training. Be blessed.